We're Sarah and Yael, PhD students in Brown University's Egyptology and Assyriology department. While there's certainly a lot of interesting academic work happening in Near Eastern studies, the Academy is not the only place to get caught up on the coolest news items. One resource that many Assyriologists subscribe to is the Agaday Listserv, compiled by Jack Sasson, the Mary Jane Worthen Professor of Judaic and Biblical Studies at Vanderbilt University. We have scoured the internet for the most exciting news stories and public scholarship related to the ancient Near East, subscribing to our favorite blogs and following the most fascinating research we can find on Twitter. Scholarship can come to us anyway, anywhere, and anyhow. Throughout the month, Yale and I will curate a selection of items for interested non-specialists, then we'll share them with you in videos like this so that you can be part of the conversation. In July of this year, the American School of Classical Studies at Athens announced the Scarborough Fellowship, which aims to address the historical underrepresentation of people of color in scholarly communities centered around classical studies. This past month, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Michelle Valerie Ronick, John W.I. Lee, and Mark Lowell for the Oxford University Press blog write about the history of people of color and the ASCSA and how this fellowship continues work that began in the 1880s. What connects the founding of Baghdad to the New York Yankees to COVID-19? The process of finding answers in the stars that we know as astrology. An important scientific endeavor in many ancient societies, astrology bleeds into more areas of our lives than we are ever aware of. Check out this long form piece from Atlas Obscura on the many ways astrology has played an important role throughout history. The sun disk of the god, sun god Shamash is an iconic symbol appearing in various contexts over thousands of years. With most traces of color missing from our artifacts of reference, how are we to reconstruct the colors of the sun disk? It turns out it's possible. Check out this well-researched thread from Andrew DeLucas on the colors of the Shamash sun disk. In another brilliant Twitter thread, Aisha, better known to many as Proto-Semite, answers your burning questions about what the Epic of Gilgamesh may have sounded like spoken. And he does so by reading it aloud for us. Check out his thread for some fascinating spoken Akkadian. The beginning of September saw the virtual meeting of the Deconstructing Nubia Workshop showcasing a series of experts on Nubia and their work tackling the many problems that have restrained the study of Nubia for so long. If you missed the workshop, have no fear. Aaron D'Souza has your back. Check out his latest blog post highlighting some of the key points from the workshop and the main outputs that are coming down the pipeline. Did that last news item have you wondering about what kind of research the study of Nubia entails? Check out the latest talk for everyday Orientalism from Dr. Solange Ashby. In this video, Dr. Ashby walks us through the cult of Isis and Nubia and why the study of Southern connections to ancient Egypt are important to our understanding of the history of ancient African civilizations. The Ancient Near Eastern Empires blog from the University of Helsinki is back. Kicking off this comeback is Alexi Sahala, who introduces us to his work on natural language processing tools as a way of evaluating word embeddings for the Akkadian language. Read the post for more on what we can learn from this work and why it's important. The Helsinki blog is definitely back and it is churning out fascinating post after fascinating post. Following Sahala's work comes a piece from Ellie Bennett on what it means to be a man during the Neo-Syrian period. Check out her piece for how she is tackling this complex question using computational methods. In a groundbreaking article for the Classical Receptions Journal, Brown University PhD candidate Kelly Wynn explores classical reception in and beyond Vietnam for the first time. Recently, Wynne spoke to Sarah Bond in an interview for the Society for Classical Studies on why this work is important to her and to the wider world of classical studies. You can read this interview over on the SCS website. The discovery of 59 sealed sarcophagi at Saqqara is about to get the Netflix treatment. Netflix is set to release a documentary on this incredible discovery following the team's work in the run-up to the big find. You can check out the trailer to get hyped up about the exciting discovery all over again. If you're anything like me, you can barely keep up with all of the cool books coming out these days about the ancient world. If you're interested in Assyriology and Mesopotamian archaeology, Mar Shiprim from the International Association for Assyriology has you covered. On their blog, they rounded up all of the great books published in the summer of 2020 for you to peruse. If you're watching this, you are connected to the internet. If you're wondering how else the internet can connect to the ancient world, look no further than Aaron Tugendhaft's new book, The Idols of Isis, From Assyria to the Internet. Destruction is universal, and the internet can bring us closer to both ancient and modern forms. 
It may be November now, but that doesn't mean you can't still enjoy some spooky stories. The infamous curse associated with the discovery of King Tut's tomb gets the podcast treatment from Supernatural with Ashley Flowers. Check out the episode for the chilling story and decide for yourself if the Pharaoh's curse is real. Recent studies of clothing in the ancient Near East have focused on textiles as material culture, giving us information about the times in which they existed. But many of these textiles were worn by humans on their bodies as clothing. In a post for Ancient Near East Today, Alison Thomason writes about the promise and struggles of working on the archaeology of clothing. The past two months have been awesome for hyperallergic articles about the ancient world, and we are 100% here for it. In a piece that pulls no punches in regards to colonialism, Catherine Bluen, Monica Hanna, and Sarah E. Bond examine how academic cosplay from Melania Trump to academic Egyptologists engages with the most problematic parts of history. Also for hyperallergic, Edward Blyberg asked the seemingly simple question, why are the noses broken on Egyptian statues? We often take for granted that ancient statues are broken from the ravages of time. However, the answer to this question might be more complex than you're expecting. Check out the essay to learn more about these statues from what isn't there rather than from what is. If you're looking for a little more play in your life, the History of Games conference from last month has made the videos of their virtual talks available. Take a look at interesting and short forays into topics like the transcultural history of snakes and ladders or the meaning of games in Greek and Roman cultures. In the past year of making these videos, we featured work from Eidolon regularly. The platform has long been a way for brilliant editors to help equally brilliant writers share the ancient world in an accessible way. This past, past month, Editor-in-Chief Donna Zuckerberg announced that she would be leaving her position and Eidolon will be closing its virtual doors. We will miss the people and the work that made Eidolon such a success and power for good in the world. From the Assyriology Today team, thank you and goodbye. That's it for September and October's selection. Thanks again to Dr. Sasson for his work on creating this list, for the community for creating awesome things, and to you and your interest. We'll see you next month with November's most interesting items.